Well, we're back for another show, and I am with Ian Tasso. How are you, Ian? Doing good. Hanging in there. How about yourself? Not too bad. I mean, I'd rather be in the sunny south southwest Florida or, or Tampa area like you are than <laughs> Virginia. So Hey, you we, know what, though? Uh, July, August, not exactly ideal times of year to be down here. The thing I've hot. noticed, though, is it's, <laughs> it's hot everywhere. Yeah, that's true. It, it is. It's hot up here. That's true. Uh, it's not as humid. Everybody up here says it's humid. I'm like, well, go, yeah, Orlando yeah. when I lived there. It's like, yeah, you're not, you're not going to do it. Yeah, I was in Fort Myers for a couple of years. And, I mean, you're almost in the Everglades. And, yeah. I mean, like 110 with 100% humidity, that's a different kind of hot. It's, um, I love Southwest Florida. I lived, uh, when I first lived there, I lived in Fiddlesticks Country Club off Daniels. Okay. I don't know if you yeah. know that club, but it's yeah. a really nice course. Very well. Um, and then I just, um, within the last few years, I lived at uh, Coconut Point. I got a condo over there. Love it there. And it was yeah. great because, you know, I could walk down, have dinner. Yep. Um, it was nice for walking. Yep. It's a pretty secure place. Good location. I love great. Southwest Florida. Um, but tell us a little bit. You got a cool journey with your sports career and um, kind of walk us through your path and i'm going to interrupt you a few times because i have some cool questions that i sure. think that i want to know <laughs> well let me start off by saying i hope i never move again i am just done uh, packing unpacking like i think i'm done i'm good so. i told my wife we have two more moves left <laughs> so i it. hate to move though i hate oh to move. gosh it's like but I, I think I'm finally found a spot where I like, and I'm just, that's it. No more yeah, make it packing work. tape, no more. Yeah, I'm just, if I see another packing peanut the rest of my <laughs> life, I'm going to lose my life. Um, it's the tough part of this business. It is, it is. You almost, you almost have to be willing to move around, right? Um, you know, and right now it's kind of interesting because everyone is remote, it seems. But, you know, that will, that will wear off at, at some point, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, you said it, you, you've got to be willing to, to move around if, if you kind of want to rise through the ranks in this industry. So, but, um, so I started, I graduated college in, in Boston, where I was originally from with a, uh, with a journalism degree. So I was, you know, one of those kids, I, I wrote for the Boston Globe a little bit in the sports section, and I had my own sports radio show. And, you know, I wanted to be a play by play guy. Like, that was my thing. And uh, come to find out, there's not many of those jobs available in sports <laughs> and uh, tough. a lot of people want those jobs. So I wound up at an ECHL, which is, you know, double A hockey uh, career fair out in Las Vegas, just kind of like, you know, scraping the barrel at this point. Like I'd sent my resume to everywhere I can think of. And so I went out there and um, wound up landing myself a, a job with the Las Vegas Wranglers, which, was a double a hockey team in vegas they've since been replaced by an nhl team an nfl team you know like <laughs> pretty much everything yeah we we broke the ground we we put the blueprint together that's what i like to say um but yeah so they basically said hey look we we'd love to have you do the play-by-play -play, but we can't pay you. you you have to sell and i was like okay what does that mean <laughs> so um you know, I didn't really have much else going on at the time. So I, I figured, why not? And I loaded up every belonging I owned, you know, in my Camry and, and drove cross country. And uh, that was how I started as a sales rep. I had no prior training, just kind of, hey, I want to I wanna sort of pay for my dream. Like You wanted I, to do that play-by-play -play that bad. I, I you know, <laughs> I, I did. And looking back on it, I mean, I, I don't do any play-by-play -play anymore. So my journey has like totally reach, you know, changed what I wanted to do. But yeah, I was, uh, I was all in that. You know? So when you got out of school, I mean, was there any thought in your head that you would get into sales or something else in sports? No, no. I mean, I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't really think about that side of the sports industry. I mean, I grew up as a, as a, just like everyone does, you're a sports fan. You know, you, you, you hear the play by play guy, you see the, the team GMs, the presidents, but you don't really think about being a sales rep. Um, no. It come to find out, you know, after now being in the industry for you know, almost a decade now, that's how you get into sports. And so I found that out pretty quickly. But. 
Yeah, no, I mean, it definitely, and the thing is, I mean, it's, it's cool that you were able to transition into that and then, then follow you, follow the sales side, because I know a lot of play by play people and they're not salespeople. So, um, it, it's definitely a different animal. So when you were with Las Vegas, were you selling, were you like full menu? Were you selling partnerships and tickets or what, like what kind of stuff do they have you do? I was, and you probably, I mean, you live this, man. You know, you have for a while. I was group sales, season ticket sales, sponsorship sales, skate cleaning duty after the games. I dressed up as the the bright green radioactive bull mascot more <laughs> nice. times than you I. You've got to at least be the mascot once in your career if you're in <laughs> yeah, sports. I, I don't care what I you are. Only once. The mascot yeah. had quit like my first year and I was the only guy with the right height qualifications to fit into that. I mean, we talk about hot in Florida and it gets hot in Vegas, like 120, but you haven't experienced hot until you've been out on a golf course in a buck 20 wearing a <laughs> mascot suit that hasn't been washed in like 20 years. I mean, yeah. the smells have like scarred me for the rest of my life, but you got to put in the work, you know what I mean? Like that's how you get started in the minors. So. It's it's definitely a way to keep uh, keep on the good side of the GM. That's for sure. Yes. Yep. You just you just nod your head and say yes. To I think they paid like eight bucks an hour for that, which was like a bonus. You know, minor leagues like just starting right for out the of mascot college. or for the sales position for mascot. So it was like yep. a bonus. Like if I mascot it on the weekends <laughs> once in a while, you know, extra 30, 40 bucks. Yeah. You know, like that's that's one drink on the strip. I know? was gonna say, well, I mean, as somebody young, you know, just you know, coming out of school, you know, not right. that long. Um, it's a lot. Yeah, it's any a lot. any extra bucks is uh, is good. Right. So how would you get from Las Vegas down to the Everblades in Fort Myers? Yeah. So I mean, in in Vegas, I did like a little bit of everything, right? And and I, you know, even when I ran my own radio show in in Boston, I had always, you know, had sort of a a sales type personality. Like we used to get, you know the little burrito place down the road to sponsor our show. And I was always brokering those deals. So I kind of <laughs> always had that type of mindset. And so when I got started in Vegas, you know, over the course of three years, I found that I sort of got bored of the play by play. I mean, I love it. Don't get me wrong. It was, you know, great experience traveling in the back of the bus, you know, that type of stuff um, came this close to a championship my first year, but I sort of found was, that. Who I, was that? Was that against the Everblades? It was against the Everblades. Because I was in Fort Myers your, when you were in Vegas for the okay. first few years. Yeah. I was uh, a co-owner of the arena football team there. Okay. The, and, the Tarpons, uh, right? Yeah. 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 Yep. So I was one of the founders of that. And yeah. Okay. so I, I, I remember, I mean, the Everblades were always kind of in the hunt for always. championships. It's one of those good teams. I remember we went up 2-0 and I'm thinking, you know, like, or 1-0 and we were up 2 nothing in the second game. And I'm like, I'm going to win a ring, but, you know, my first year. We lost the next four games. Like, I was at I, the final. I was at the final game in Fort Myers. It was so. It was crazy. It, it packed house, and that was yeah. like my first experience with the Everblades. And it was kind of funny because I wound up there, but I got. I became good friends with some of the staff guys being on that trip, and so uh, yeah. I remember we were up two nothing in the second game. And I'm thinking this is this is cool. It's, this so you is were cool. down in Fort Myers for that with the with the Vegas team yes when we lost yep and nice. that second game I'll never forget being the up place was nothing. jacked up that game we lost seven to two <laughs> so we were up to another like lost seven to two I'm like this is bad but yeah that place it was like fireworks in the arena there was oh, you it was know, pyrotechnics but anyway long story short so yeah I I really enjoyed the sales piece I'm you know competitive I like you know seeing my name up on the board and honestly at first it was just a side thing to sort of help pay for being the play-by-play -play guy. And then, you know, I was started selling sponsorships and I tell this to any young reps, you know, we hire kids. Um, if you have a chance to work in the minor leagues, start in the minor leagues, I would, I would take that 10 times out of 10. You get to sell sponsorships and premium your first couple of years, stuff that you won't get to touch in the higher levels, you know, for four or five years. So I, I really, really enjoyed some of the stuff I got to do. And then the team folded. <laughs> Um, which is sort of the unfortunate reality of working in the minor leagues. It's yeah. all good and, until it's not. Right. Um, and it was funny because we broke attendance records that year. I mean, we were, we were, you know, top third of the league in attendance, but it was one of those arena disputes with renewing the in, league. In uh, Vegas? In Vegas, yeah. So what, what, was that New or was it New Orleans arena? Yeah, it was or the Orleans, Orleans. Arena. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, I know it's expensive though, too, to, to operate is. like in that yeah. market. Like I want to say we had a, a indoor soccer team that played out of there for okay. a few years yep. and the amount that they were paying in rent for the facility was That's ridiculous. You, it's hard to make it work. And even just hockey teams in general, I think from a minor league standpoint, probably have such a higher operating cost because of the ice and, and everything else that comes along with it. So um, it was a fun ride though. But yeah, once they folded, I mean, literally that day I got a call from the Everblades. And, Damn, you know, that's, like, that's nice when you're getting calls that quick. I mean, yeah, we're like in the meeting, everyone's really sad. The team's folding. I'm like, home. I got a new job. I'm like, hold on, I gotta, I gotta go pack. No, but it was sad. I mean, you know, it's your first job. You spend three years out there, you forge. Yep some great relationships, but they basically said, Hey, we need someone to run premium. Um, we have a play by play guy. Would you be willing to do just that? And I said, yeah, that's actually kind of what I was looking for my next step. Anyhow. Um, I kind of looked in the, in the, in the, the what is a crystal ball in my future at 45 in the back of a bus, you know, being a hockey play by play guy. And I'm like, ah, I don't yeah. know if that's for me. So let's, no. let's try the sales thing out. So I hopped in Can the make more money again. in sales too. So you can. And, and, um, you know, so I drove, you know, back in the Camry again, all the way out to Fort Myers had never been there before and, and sort of started with the Everblades. So that's pretty cool. How, yeah. So how did you, so you're in ECHL, you're kind of building up, you know, some success. So how do you get from there to, you know, the major leagues, you know, through, uh, Van Wagner? Yeah. Um, honestly, it was one of those as cheesy as it sounds kind of create your own luck type of situation. I, um, I went to the Everblades and you know, I was the leading sales guy in Vegas, which was pretty cool as a play-by-play -play and media relations guy to just, you know, dominate all facets of the game. Right. Um, so that was really fun. And I went to the Everblades and I mean, within like three or four months, I was 200% to goal and stuff like that. So it nice. was, it was really good. I had a great time there. I learned a lot, but I think I, I was starting to realize that, you know, maybe I needed to kind of find that next step. Um, and, um, you know, my girlfriend had been eyeing the Atlanta market for work as well. And I was like, shoot, man, let's, let's make it happen. So I sent out a LinkedIn message, you know, to every team in the area, I sent out emails. I just kind of started pounding the pavement and, um, Evan, you know, get him her and, 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 uh, the Van Wagner team happened to reach back out and said, Hey, we're putting together a, a team for the new brave stadium. Um, you know, which was scary for me because the most expensive ticket I had ever sold was like, eight hundred dollars <laughs> right and, well so that that's a big brand. question i have though i mean yeah. how does that how do you make that transition my, my ultimate goal has been to be the president of a, a major league you know mm -hmm. team obviously I'm not going to go from where i'm at to that but right to take that step to major league you know how how was that because I'm, I'm looking at okay i sell up to low six-figure deals yep um, now in minor league and most of the deals are in minor league that, that I've been selling with the baseball team here and 15 to 30,000. Right. You know, and that's a good size deal for that level. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we've yeah. been very fortunate with the the baseball team here and even with soccer. I mean, our big deals in for uh, indoor or outdoor soccer, we were doing in that 75 to a hundred thousand range per year. Yep. Um, but a, the average for that's probably 7,500 to 10,000. Yep. And, and my similar biggest, to hockey. Yeah, very similar. My biggest sale at the Everblades. And I mean, I was really pumped about it. It was like $12,000. But it was a huge deal to me because, you yeah. know, you, you're a young rep. You're making 10%. And that's a yeah. lot of money in the minor leagues. And uh, so then I'll never forget, I interviewed with Evan. And I mean, like, I'm, I was a pretty confident sales rep. You know what I mean? Like, I felt good about my stuff. I had never been more nervous in my life to, get, to take that job. I mean, like... Yeah. He told me that the most, the cheapest ticket I'd be selling was like $7,000 on a three-year commitment. And I'm like, the most expensive ticket I sell is 800 bucks right now. Right. So immediately you're like, this is just not going to happen. So how did you convince him that you could make that transition? It was the second greatest sales job I've ever done in my life. First, <laughs> first is your life. Yeah. yeah. Convincing my girlfriend to stick around for the last 10 years. Um, I'll never forget, halfway through the interview, he cuts me off. He's like, I'm going to stop you there again. He's like, I, I like you, but I, I don't love you. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> okay. okay. And he's like, he's like, I need you to take me from like to love. He's like, why don't you take the next week and think about it and we'll, we'll get together and, and talk a little bit more. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like that was like, as a young sales rep, you know, that's basically. Talk about an ego blow. And yeah. You just scary. got 
stuffed on fourth down, you know? Um, so I spent the next week putting together a PowerPoint presentation about myself and why I'd be a good fit. Even though I probably was not on the experience level that they were looking for, I felt like I had some stuff to offer. And so I went through my pitch to him and um, he basically said, hey, look, um, we're going to hire you, but you're going to be the worst sales rep we have on staff, just so you know. He's like, I'm going to hire six or seven people better than you. And it's going to be your job to basically prove me wrong, essentially. And I was like, that's a pretty aggressive thing to say before you even hire me. But I was like, that was the motivation. I like it. That yeah. was the motivation that I needed. I mean, and he probably knew that, you know, just by yeah. interviewing me, knowing my personality. And yeah, so that was like, come to find out he's not, a, you know, a hard ass by any means or anything. Like yeah. that was just him sort of giving me the kick. Pushing you. Yeah. It. and it worked man I, I took that job i was so nervous the first couple weeks i eventually realized it's the same process um whether you're selling a seven thousand dollar deal a seventy thousand dollar deal a seven hundred dollar deal it's all relative like i found out pretty quickly that the the thousand dollar season tickets that i sell to some lady in fort myers that money is just as important to her as the hundred thousand dollars is to company X, Y, and Z who's buying season tickets for the Braves. Yep. It's all about value. It's all about having the conversation. It might take a little longer with a higher dollar value, but it's, it's the same process. It's prospecting, it's conversations, it's questions, it's meetings, and it's finding the right fit. And so once I kind of familiar, familiarized myself with that and sort of got comfortable with that, um, you know, went on to, to have a pretty good run with the Braves, you know, led, led them in sales over the two years on the new project, which was cool for me. What now, Evan? What like, now? Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> I'm going to tag Evan. I'm, I'm right. tagging him on this when we post it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, no, it worked out great. Um, you know, he was a great leader to have. He taught me a lot. Um, Seems like he would be he'd be a good person to work for. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a very tactical leader, which I think is important in premium. You know, I had had the rah-rah guys in the minor leagues and the pound the phones and this, that, and the other thing. And Evan was more conceptual. You know, why are you asking this question? Why are you talking to this person? Who are you looking to speak with? Like some of that stuff. And being, being in the minor leagues and having a good foundation for that work ethic because I was selling hockey tickets in the desert, you know, to a team that folded. And, and I remember I was having conversations with people that I had this one like 20 minute conversation with this older lady. And I was so excited because she's like, yeah, I go to games all the time. Like I like to sit front row, you know, let's, let's do season tickets. I'm like, great. What, what, you know, area of the rink do you like to sit in? She goes, well, I like to sit behind home plate. I'm like, okay. So you think we're the baseball team. So that's, <laughs> that's what I dealt with. <laughs> So, but if I can sell that, you know, I felt pretty yeah. confident that I had that sort of baseline of, look, if I don't sell, I don't eat. And then when you combine that with sort of the tactical premium professional level insight, I think, you know, it, it puts together a, a good combination that I, I was able to find some success with. How long did it take you to get your first deal done there? Uh, we were pretty fortunate the way they had it set up. Um, you know, new stadiums are, are always interesting, right? Yeah. Because you have your wait list and your depositors and yeah. your friends and family list of the owner and the president, you know, so we had some people that were, were sort of queued up. Um, so I think it was maybe, maybe about a month or so, which still felt like an eternity, you know, cause we had a, a conversion team that was transitioning season ticket holders from the old stadium and they were selling like a million dollars a day. You know what I mean? Right. Just, and I'm like, sitting there like, <laughs> right. So, but uh, yeah, it took me about a month or so, and uh, it felt pretty good to put up, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars on the board, you know, at one at one time, which was a big deal for me. Then. So. Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely big, coming from the ECHL. Yeah. What was the biggest deal that you closed there? Ah, uh, probably. I mean, they were all four and five year deals, most of them. So I think I I closed one that was want to say like 200, 250,000 on five years. So it's like 40, 50 grand a year. No, actually 200 was annual. Oh, okay. So was, nice. Yeah. Damn, so yeah, real so, nice. Yeah. And I mean, you, you only got paid on year one, of course. Right. You know, that's, that was, you know, that my fault for not negotiating a better deal, Damn. but um, yeah, so it, it felt really good. You're talking over a million, some deals, um, which, which is really, uh, I think shows you just how, 
how similar some of those processes are. I mean, you're going from selling $700 glass seats to selling, you know, $100,000, $500,000 sports deals, but they are all so common in, in, you know, some of the points. So. I've noticed that just even from like going from soccer to affiliated baseball, I mean, affiliated baseball, we have 70 games um, for the, the advanced day here. It's just, the numbers are bigger, even, even for that. Yep. And yep. so that's why, you know, like our average partnership is, is higher than it was for soccer. Um, you know, ECHL is about half, you know, the number of games, Yep. Um, you know, arena football, which I was in was difficult because you're talking seven to 10 games maybe. Yep. Yep. And so you're still trying to get those 50, $75,000 deals and justify, you know, that it's a good partnership. So. Yeah. And, and I would say, I think the, and you mentioned a couple different sports, which I think really helps. I think being in the minor leagues and doing a little hockey and doing a little baseball and now doing a little football, it allows you to sort of separate yourself from the product a little and see it from a value standpoint, as opposed to a cost standpoint or a game standpoint. You know, I got to working for the Braves and there's, you know, 82 games and I'm going from 30 games to 82 to everyone else who, who was working in there, it was a struggle. It's so many games. Nobody wants that many games. To me, I was thinking, well, that's twice as many opportunities to entertain, you know? And so that was just kind of a different way of looking at it. And yeah, you get a lot of pushback on the amount of games, but just having that experience in different markets and different sports teams and leagues gives you kind of that perspective to sort of try to find the opportunity, even in some areas that might otherwise be challenging. When you were with um, Van Wagner, did they provide all the leads for you? Did you have to go out hunting? Like, how did that work? I'm, was, I'm uh, thinking with, with the Everblades, it was probably you going out hunting. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like, with the camo on, you're trudging through the Everglades. You were hunting, yeah, in every every sense of the word. At, at Van Wagner, was a little bit of both. So, I mean, it was an interesting partnership with Van Wagner and the Braves. It seems to be sort of the the new thing right sports teams are working with agencies when it comes to new stadiums and so you have a little bit of overlap where we were fortunate enough to have some deposit lists and like i said some referrals from you know executives at the club um but that was only the first couple months i mean once you work through those leads you're kind of on your own um so it was a lot of prospecting and and i again i think having some of that experience in the minor leagues where you you have to prospect. I mean, you're calling companies off of like index cards. I don't know if you remember <laughs> those things. <laughs> Rolodexes. Yeah. yeah. Like, so you're really, you know, working hard um, for that. But uh, yeah, we did a lot of hunting when it came to, to, to working for. What was, what worked best for you in like prospecting? <clears throat> I'm a firm believer in like diversifying the way that you prospect. So when we hire someone, you know, here at NFL on location, I'm always, um, I always get the question, is it better to email? Is it better to call? Is it better to LinkedIn? Like, all the above. All. All. <laughs> because here's yeah. the reality, you know, especially as younger generations move into power positions at companies, you're seeing a, an interesting group of, of CEOs that only answer email. Don't check their voicemail. Yep. And then you see some CEOs that never answer email, you know, right. and, and only you answer the phone. But the reality is most CEOs never get back to voicemails anyway. And, and there are some people that are super active on LinkedIn and there are some people that, that never check it. Right. So I think you have this interesting sort of, well, rather than just guess, why not do a little bit of everything? Send a LinkedIn request, leave a voicemail and then follow up with an email. Hey, I just left a voicemail, figured this might be a better way to grab you, you know, blah, blah, blah. And now all of a sudden you've got three prongs out there. And I would take that even further and, and maybe send the CEO, the CFO, the CMO, you know, cause reality is in today's day and age, there's not one person making a decision majority of the time. And, yeah. and, you know, you're just trying to get in front of someone, you know, so, so why not use all the resources you have and you can Google so much about a company now. Um, oh yeah. It's so amazing. It's like shotgun approach, I guess, is, is something I, I would say has worked pretty well. So. So what got you to NFL on location? <clears throat> yeah, so, um, you know, I listened to your, your, your podcast with Evan, and it's interesting. He brought up kind of selling yourself out of a job, but it really is sort of what happens <laughs> when you, 
you know, the new stadium jobs are great. It's a fancy new stadium. But once you sell out, you, you are not needed anymore. Bye-bye. <laughs> so yeah. I think, look, any, everyone's objective when you, when you get to a new stadium deal is, for me anyway, was to do two things. One, I'm going to be such a good sales rep that Van Wagner is going to want to find me a new opportunity under their umbrella. Yep. Two, I'm going to be such a good sales rep that the Braves are going to want to keep me on board and, and work for them. Um, and I was very fortunate. I had a really good couple of years at the end of the project, me and Evan were the only ones left. Um, and I was talking with the Braves about doing some stuff with them. Evan was working on a deal with the Hawks to do some stuff with them in their new stadium. So I kind of had some opportunities there. Um, ha had some, some family things pop up in Florida. So I was kind of had one eye on maybe relocating markets. And um, one of my senior reps, one of my bosses, I guess you could say, at uh, the Braves happened to, to take a job with NFL on location. And at first, they wanted me to go up to Minnesota. That was the Super Bowl that year. And it's they cold. said, hey, look, you moved to Minnesota for a little while. And, and I was like, this is just not going to happen for me. And then they said, okay, what if you stayed in Atlanta, but you moved back and forth to Minnesota? And I was like, well, I don't know about that. And literally – probably a week or two before I was getting ready to, to sign the paperwork to either stay with Van Wagner or the Braves. They said, okay, what if you work from wherever and you travel to and from the Super Bowl city? Like, okay. Maybe this is a conversation. Well, you know, maybe I'll hear these guys out. And um, you know, I was really, really blown away by some of the stuff they were doing. And basically if for people who may not be familiar with NFL on location, they're owned by the NFL. So it's the official hospitality team basically for the league, the pro bowl, the draft, the super bowl, you know, so you're talking to a guy who started selling minor league tickets in Las Vegas. I get a chance to sell for the super bowl, probably the biggest sporting event, you know, in the world um, and do a little traveling. And, and so for me, it was <clears throat> kind of a no brainer to, you know, when the NFL, you know, comes knocking, usually that's a, that's a call that you, that you answer. So I've uh, worked out great. I've loved it here. Do most um, reps with NFL on location work remotely or are you kind of an exception? Yeah, I, initially I was the exception. We now have one other rep that works remotely. And of course now everyone works remotely. Um, and I think it's kind of an interesting product because the reality is when you're selling for a team, your objective is to get in front of people. I mean, you know, the sponsorship and premium, especially you want to get in front of somebody because that's where you have the most success. Um, when it comes to the Super Bowl, the market changes every year. And, and I'm not just selling Tampa businesses, the Tampa Super Bowl. I'm talking New York and California yeah, and nationwide. Kansas City because the Chiefs are a good team and Baltimore because they're, you know what I mean? So we're yeah. kind of tactical in our market approach. So being in market helps, I think, get you familiar with the area, but, but I don't think you really need to be based there, at least for this particular product. And so I think what's interesting with everything going on with, with COVID and, and forcing teams to kind of reassess how they do things. I'd be interesting to see how many more reps, not only for on location, but, but, you know, elsewhere are kind of more remote centric. Um, Cause now obviously everyone is remote, but I don't know if, if that will stay the same as we move forward. So. So with on location, do you got, I mean, it looks like you guys do some stuff outside the NFL as well. Yeah, we do. So it's, it really is a fascinating, you know, business model. Basically our objective is, is to kind of become, um, you know, one-stop shop for, for whether it's companies or individuals at, at various of the premier sporting events throughout the, the world, really. So we're, we're really fortunate. We're official partners with the PGA and the NCAA. So we've got some some uh, some great opportunities with the Final Four, College Football Championship, uh, the Bowl Series, PGA, of course. You've got the Ryder Cup. Um, you know, the the Masters is an event that we do a little bit of business with as well. So I kind of have the ability to cross sell with my clients and my companies. You know, uh, the ability to entertain at a variety of different companies, and it really it kind of there's a great synergy there when it comes to cross selling and building sort of meaningful relationships with companies, you know, where you're not just kind of a one hit wonder, Hey, the Super Bowl's in your city. You should buy right. some tickets. Now it's Super Bowl, Masters, Ryder Cup, traveling, you know, it's, it's, it really kind of, it creates a, a unique opportunity. So do you go to all those events as well? <laughs> 
I wish I did. I've been Damn. to a couple. I know. Come I know. on, man. I, I, I've been to the. I went to the draft in uh, in Dallas, which was okay, really cool. cool. Yeah. Um, the first time they did it in an NFL stadium, which was really unique. Um, I've I've been to the Masters once, which I'm not even a big golf guy, truthfully, but that was just like that's awesome. Yeah. Once in a lifetime, and then I got the opportunity to go to the Super Bowl in Minnesota um, when the Eagles beat beat the Patriots. So that was I've gotten a chance to go to a couple. So. so so that one hurt, right? Since you're a Patriots fan. Yeah, what would give it away was it the jersey back Is that there? jersey from that game? <laughs> it uh yeah, it's actually kind of funny. It's a Brandon Cooks jersey. I don't know if you remember, he got a concussion like ten minutes into the game, but it was uh it was like the only jersey that was available for sale, you know, a couple of months later. So is that a game worn or not is that... game worn? Okay, no, okay, I was gonna say that had a, 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 a to be a couple of bucks. Yeah, no kidding. No, so yeah, that one hurt a little, but we've had we had a good run. You know, the Patriots have won their fair share. So, so I, are you now a Tampa Bay Bucks fan, or? I mean, I I think so, right? I mean, I, I mean, guess I don't. I mean, you're in the Tampa market. I, I mean, Brady is there, Gronk is there. Yeah, and you a know, friend of mine who worked for me with soccer now works for the the Bucks and ticket sales, and yeah. I almost I was trying to convince him to leave and come work work with me up here, and. A week later, he signs. It's like he's like sales are through the roof. This yeah, is, right. <laughs> this is just taking orders at this point. Yeah, yeah. They uh, and you know what? They deserve it. They've had such a a tough run. You know, just not being the most competitive team, or they were. They had such high hopes with Jameis, and so a lot of things have really not broken their way. So it's always good when uh, you know, they got a good staff down there and some good guys that yeah. I know fairly well. So things I could not. Up I couldn't them. get rid of my season tickets. Oh. Like I, I bought, when he got the job there, I wanted to be the first sale for him. Um, Cause he worked for me in St. Louis with the ambush. Then I brought him down to Florida for the tropics. And when I was selling, I connected him with uh, the bucks and I was like, I gotta get, it. I got tickets. And I mean, people wouldn't even take them for free no. half the time. No. You, so you, now, now I could make money. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's, and, and it's funny as a Patriots fan, like, of course I'm still going to root for the Patriots. Right. You know, that's, I grew up up there, but you know, when you grow up, I mean, really my entire football watching life, Tom Brady's been the quarterback. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to go to a couple more Bucks games than I normally would, you know? Yeah. So. What kind of stuff do you guys do it like on location, anything different from your prior stuff that like kind of has helped you with your sales process or developing personally? It's, it's such a heavy prospecting job. I mean, really the, the bulk of my day is spent trying to find companies and really just about every company in the country is a potential buyer for something. I mean, with yep. the Masters and the Final Four and the Super Bowl being such a big draw, there really is no shortage of companies to call. So, um, you know, we use uh, it's Zoom Info, which I don't know if you're familiar with, with that. Um, so I guess it's an app. Um, What's it called? Zoom Info. It's, it's an awesome. Yeah, I did a demo with them. It's uh, and I, I'll, I'll be looking out for my check, you know, from, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from pumping them up here. But you know, it's a great tool, and there's a lot of tools out there. But uh, being able to to sort market by market and really sort of pinpoint, um, you know, some companies to reach out to. So I would say, you know, having a good background with the Braves and the minor leagues, a lot of prospecting, um, and it, it is it's much more transactional than than working for a team. I've noticed, you know, I think when you're when you're working for a team, it's it's a very long sales process. It's getting in front of someone, having some discovery, getting them down to the site, you know, showing them the seats. Whereas with the Super Bowl, it's, it's very much, Hey, you know, people respond to your emails more often than not. They're not going to yeah. say, I want to be behind home plate. Like, right. No, yeah. They're... <laughs> not yet. Anyway, you, you get a lot more responses, you know, um, CEOs will write you back and you'll know very quickly whether it's a conversation worth having or, or whether it's not. And, and you have, you know, you're meeting with them and, and you know, pretty quickly you, when you're talking about, you know, 15 to $30,000 a ticket, um, you know, that's a, that's a decision that is made more on, you know, emotion and excitement. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that I think you can pick on up on fairly early on in the process. So it's a little bit more transactional than I, than I think working at a team has been in the past. So. What's kind of like the high end dollar amount for sales for, for that kind of stuff. I yeah, think you so do some of the suites. Yeah, we do a little bit of everything. So we have, you know, your basic tickets, you know, they're going to start at about 5,000 a person. 
um, you know, upper bowl. And, and then our super premium will get, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20,000 this year. Last year, it was a little more being in Miami and, and some of the clubs that they, that they were able to accommodate. Um, you know, so it, it gets up there, you know, those deals add up, add up pretty quickly. Uh, but it, it, it presents a unique challenge, you know, because I think it's, it's as a sales rep, it's really hard for me to sit here and talk about ROI um, you know, when it's really, it's a four hour event and, and they're spending probably $200,000. So that's, that's a tough, yeah. you know, discussion <laughs> to have. So you have to kind of look for other angles, you know, and, and I think the opportunity to, to entertain at the biggest sporting event in the world and more often than not take friends and family and stuff like that once in a lifetime, you know, you kind of have to find different, different angles, um, for, for what you're pitching. Yeah, no, I mean that, that definitely makes sense. How has it been like, so, okay, you've been in the minors, you've been agency. Um, like what, what area have you, you know, liked kind of the most? Um, it's a good question. And, and the least. Yeah, it's a good question. And I'm going to give you a, probably an answer. You're not, you're not wanting, but I think the there's political there's, answer. There's, <laughs> there's pros and cons with both. Seriously. Yeah. And I mean that, I mean, working in a team game, I remember as a young sales rep, you know, living and dying with the team, you know, they win, you're pumped. Competitive. Yeah. You got that. You're part yeah. of the team. And especially being the play by play guy traveling and, and all that. I think, you I know, the guys. Them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're one of the guys, right? Like, um, but I think there's also a, a work life balance challenge that I found um, at that level. And so I, I do enjoy working for the agency, you know, sort of third party, but not really because you, you kind of have a little bit more of a normalized schedule. I mean, you're still working late hours, you're still working weekends, but not working games. So I think there's, there's some unique pros and cons. Um, if I had to pick which one I really did enjoy working um, on the new stadium. I really liked the agency side of things and, and hearing your discussion with Evan, I think he, he touched on really a lot of, of cool opportunities that exist in the agency world. Um, you know, I think there's, like I said, pros and cons for both. I'd highly recommend young reps out there do as much of both as they can start with a team, work through the ranks, start in the minor leagues. I think you learn a lot and depending on your personality, the team might be the best fit. The, the agency might be the best fit, but again, you know, there, there's good and good and, and stress with, with both. So. Yeah. There's no one clear cut. No, no. Sorry. That's sorry. Not the answer you were looking for. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's true. I mean, I only know the, I mean, minor league from a league and team standpoint, I had, I mean, I still have it active, uh, small agency where I've, I've done stuff, you know, probably for the last four or five years. Um, that's probably what I'll go back to if, uh, unless I find the right opportunity, but, yeah. um, it's, I think they all, like you said, they all have their advantages with your current role. Do you have to, you manage anyone or is it just strictly sales that you you're focused on? And majority sales, I'm going to, I'm a senior manager here. So I do sort of help a little bit with, you know, onboarding, hiring, training, stuff like that, but pr primarily focused on sales, which especially right now is obviously a challenge with everything going on. Um, so I think there's a little bit more of an emphasis now on some of the other stuff, um, you know, making sure we're buttoned up in our strategy, making sure we're on point with, you know, our pitches and stuff like that. So a little bit more of the back end stuff right now, but usually it's, it's mostly focused on sales. How big is the sales team with um, on location? So right now we have eight full-time reps um, kind of sprinkled around. So I'm in Tampa. We have another, another guy in Orlando. We actually have one or two in New York. Um, and where the league office is. And then we have our main, uh, you know, crew is, is in Atlanta. Um, and then on that group, we have, I think there's three of us senior guys. And then, and then obviously, you know, kind of a, a, a boss who sort of oversees the whole project. So. Like throughout your career, I mean, you've, you've kind of worked at some good organizations. Has anyone, you know, kind of mentored you along or anybody like really kind of shown you the way to, you know, help you develop? Yeah. I mean, there's been a couple people. Evan is one you talked with. He's obviously just such a unique perspective when it comes to selling. Um, and I would say 90% of the, of the managers or, or people I've seen in the industry, it's very, you know, gung ho 
hundred calls a day, like, you know, stay at work from sun up to sundown. Right. Which is great. I mean, you need that. And, and Evan's Evan is much more strategic and he's, he's very, very intelligent with, with his, um, with his attack on businesses and sort of his approach. And, and then um, Nick Nicastro is one that I've, I've worked under actually at the Braves and, and also at NFL on location. He's, he's the one who kind of brought me on board at the NFL. Um, and, and he's just, you know, kind of one of those consummate professionals. I mean, like does it the right way. He's, he's sold at every new stadium you can possibly think of. Um, and, and just has a great experience. And I think is, is one of those like lead by example type guys, you know, like he puts in the work. Um, and that's something that, you know, even as you get sort of older in the industry, you, you kind of respect that and, and it sort of motivates you to, to make sure you're pulling your weight, you know? So I would say those two people have been guys that I've really picked a, a lot from over the years. That's cool. I mean, it's, I think having the right leadership makes such a difference mm -hmm. and, you know, making sure that you have leadership that is going to help develop. And you, I see a lot of people in leadership roles that, that aren't helping their staffs develop. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's sad to see because, you know, I look at it as uh, it's almost like, you know, like the sales team, I, I kind of look at them almost like, you know, my kids, like I want to, I want to yeah. see them develop. I want to see them prosper. I want to see them move on to bigger things. And of course, you know, it's a big, big, big thing for me is just building, you know, building teams up, building people up, giving them opportunities to, to flourish. So yeah, and I think it's important. I mean, one of the guys who who I would attribute some of my just sort of managerial learning to is, is a gentleman named uh, Dan Rosenthal, who I don't know if you're familiar with. He Sounds familiar. Spent a, spent a lot of time um, in basketball and up in New York. But one of the things I learned from him, which I think is is so true, and I, I try to practice it every day, especially when it comes to, to managing, is, you know, there's not a one-size-fits-all thing. And you know this, especially in the minor leagues, you get some characters, right? You get people from all walks of life. Um, Can't wait to write my book. Right. <laughs> right. And, and if, if you want to motivate everyone the same, it's just not going to work. And so I think what's important as a manager is, is like getting to know your reps on a level that's beyond just being their boss. And I'm not saying be best friends with everybody, but understand what makes them tick, understand yeah. what's important to them because your goals are going to be different than their goals and, and his goals are going to be different from her goals. But once you understand those things about somebody, that's where you can get, you know, the most out of them as a sales rep. And, and I think you and Evan talked about this a little at the minor league level, you have to get the most out of absolutely everybody. And so I think that's super important. I'm going to jump back for the last thing. Okay. I want to hear the craziest story from your minor league adventures because <laughs> oh, i know there's got to be a couple good ones <laughs> your craziest story yeah just uh, off the wall i mean look being a being a green bull is one that that's obviously i've told a little bit of that um i would say one of the the, the weirdest things that i've ever experienced um was being a play-by-play -play guy for Vegas. I wasn't allowed to travel, um, you know, my first year until we got to the finals. And they, they let me travel finally for the, for the first time. And I was so excited. And the, the president told me, it's not because you're doing a good job. It's because we need the audio in case we win. We need our home audio. He's uh -huh. like, just want to make that clear. <laughs> okay, cool. So I, I'm all excited. I, I get you know, to the plane. And, um, of course I'm sitting next to all these super fans, you know, from Florida Everblades. Right. And, and I'm just like, this is, you know, flying the red eye cause everyone else had their flights booked weeks in advance. And I was spur of the moment. So back of the continental flight, like, you know, and, and so, you know, I, I get there, we land, um, and the team is in the middle of a practice. So I can't, I can't go anywhere. So one of the super fans offers to take me to the arena or whatever. So I spent, I spent basically 45 minutes crammed in a van with a bunch of Florida Everblade super fans. And I'm like, this is the minor league life right now, man. You know? That's awesome. So. They, I'll tell you what, they got super fans there though. Like, they I do. mean, it's crazy. They do. One of them um, told me he would buy me a Subway sandwich for before the game the next day. But okay. Sure enough, I went up to the booth and there was a Subway sandwich sitting on my on my desk. 
Yeah. I don't know if this is good or bad or what. Bro. We're going to buy this for you because we're about to beat your ass. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. But uh, no, good people. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, look, man, the minor leagues is a different animal. I mean, you know this. It's, yeah. The hours are crazy. The the responsibilities, you know, span the gambit. But uh, I really, truly do. And I'm going to say it again because I think it's so important, especially for young reps out there. Like, it, if you have the opportunity to get into the minor leagues, I know there's a lot of people who, you know, they want to work for the Red Sox and the Yankees and the Giants, and they don't really think about the minor leagues as an option. I would recommend wholeheartedly. I think it's, it's great experience. I think you, you get to do a lot. Um, and I think it's, it's a big reason why I, I've sort of been able to follow the path that, I, that I've had here in, in sports. So My challenge has been trying to make the leap from minor league to major league. My situation's a little different because I'm not entry level and sure. I couldn't afford to, to go that low, but right. um, that's, that's kind of been my, my challenge. Cause you know, when you get into, you know, director VP level, I'm a risk somewhat, you know, I yep. need to find somebody that can, can, can relate to the struggle of selling big deals at the minor league level and how hard that is. And, I think sometimes when you get into, like you said, you had trouble with uh, Las Vegas, you know, tickets behind home plate. I mean, when you're selling the Atlanta Braves, you're not going to have people like people know right. the brand, right? You know, the Super Bowl. Hmm? I, whether you've ever watched a football game, everybody, I, I don't know. I mean, there's probably somebody out there, but I, I just can't imagine somebody not knowing what the Super Bowl was. Right. It's diff different objections, right? I mean, yeah. neither one is easier or harder than the other. I mean, I would say maybe you could make the case that selling in the minor leagues is harder. I mean, if you can do it there, you can, you really, as, as cheesy as it sounds, you can do it anywhere. I mean, if you can sell, you know, season tickets to people who, who you know, on, uh, a lot of those individuals like are, are having trouble making ends meet, but they love the team, you know, they're obsessed with the team. And so if you can, figure out a way to present value to those individuals, you know, then, then presenting value to a company um, is, is just the same. And so I really do think that it's, if you, if you can sell at that level, I think you're going to find success elsewhere. Um, you just have to find someone who's been through the struggle because really the yeah, only ones no, exactly. are, are the ones who've, who've been there. You know? So you need to, you need to keep bumping your, your thing up and, and right. uh, keep in touch. <laughs> right. <laughs> One of these days, you know, yeah. I don't know where, where you go from here. You know, working at the Super Bowl is great. So I don't know what that's awesome. What, yeah. what the next chapter will will hold? It's been a crazy path, um, but uh, so would you say just because this made me think of something else is mm -hmm. when you went from minor league to major league, that it went from maybe um, less, more consumers in minor league to more businesses in major league. Definitely, kind and, of and that. Flipped. That may be because when I was with the Braves, we were the premium sellers. So we were really only focused on that, you know, the behind home plate inventory, which I had experience selling <laughs> in my days in hockey. We were really only focused on the, the multi-year premium stuff. So, and I think that tends to be more of a, a, a corporate crowd anyhow, but yeah, much more of a, of a transition. And now um, I would say it's very similar at the Super Bowl, you know, uh, probably more, more so corporate or it's, it's business owners who are maybe doing something on a personal level, but it's, it's much more corporate leaning uh, than it was at the minor league level, but I was an entry level in the minor league. So, I mean, I, I think yeah. if I could go back and do it all over again in the minor leagues, I think I would probably attack companies more because yeah. I, there's a real opportunity that a lot of minor league reps don't, maybe have the tools to explore or aren't encouraged to explore. But really, I mean, there's, there's just such an, an opportunity there, um, especially in those towns where there isn't a major league team, there isn't a Braves, there isn't a Yankees to advertise and entertain at. So you have the opportunity to kind of be that um, for them at a much more cost-effective level. So, um, you know, I think there's, there's opportunity for both. I know I said last thing three times now, but last, <laughs> I think last thing. Tell me about um, your website, though, mm -hmm. because yeah. I saw that on your website, too, um, you have some, like, good tips and information, and that goes back to your experience in writing and, and broadcasting yeah. and communication. Right. So what's the web address and kind of what is the purpose of the site? Yeah, I appreciate the uh, the tip of the cap there. So it's like the website's really complicated. It's iantasso.com. <laughs> so it's pretty easy for people to remember. Honestly, I just – 
over the last couple of months, especially with everything going on and, and working from home, um, I think as a as a premium rep, I sort of realized that look, I can't I can't be making hundred calls a day. I can't be prospecting as aggressively as I as I was. I can't be sending these emails. One because it I think it comes off in poor taste. Two because it's not going to be very effective. And and I'm very um, tactical about spending time in places that I think is is going to benefit you the most. So I sort of started to think, hey, you know, what are some things I can do with my time that might have more of a positive uh, impact? And, you know, I saw your free agent Friday that you're doing, which I think is, is awesome. I mean, using an opportunity to, to help folks in such a, such a unique time, I kind of look, have found a, a similar discovery. I was like, hey, why don't I just start putting some of my ideas on a website? Because I, I think now more than ever is an opportunity for young reps, especially to network because everyone is at home. Everyone is, is or to looking maybe not so much now as things ramp up but a couple months ago and, and and take the opportunity to sharpen your skills because you may never have the time that you have right now 100 we, we yeah. talk about this in the minor leagues especially but even in pro sports when the season's going on you don't have any time <laughs> right. any, yeah. i mean so now talk about hey there's no games for a lot of leagues there's nothing to even sell are you going to sit at home and watch netflix all day or are you going to say, hey, look, here's an opportunity to, to really do something. And, and so I, I figured, you know, maybe I could help that out. And, and so I wrote a couple of entries about, you know, various things, prospecting and overcoming objections and what to do when companies ghost you and stuff like that. And yeah, I got a pretty good response. So hopefully it's been helpful to people that have, have checked in on it. I, I plan on continuing to add content. Um, you know, I always joke, I mean, look, we sell tickets to games where people pay thousands of dollars to watch athletes who literally all they do is practice. That's why they're so good. Yeah. We as sales reps do no yeah. practice and we're wow. expected to be just as good. And so for me, it's always been, Hey, why don't we tune things up a little bit more, especially now, because in, in the last thing I'll say before I'll, I'll turn my rant off, I promise, but quite, quite passionate about all this is if you thought it was hard selling before COVID, I mean, now you're trying to get six figure deals out of companies who are coming out of laying half their staff off, losing customers left and right. Individuals who bought season tickets now are, are having different difficulties pop up. So if you thought it was hard before, it's going to be even more yeah, challenging really. now. So this yeah. is, is really a time where you as a rep have to be honed in. And, and I think it's going to give reps an opportunity to really distance themselves from the crowd if they can come out of this hot, you know, where I think most folks will, will probably find it tough sledding for a while. Yeah. I mean, with, with my staff, I've focused on, you know, um, professional development. We've had, we, at one point we were on zoom calls twice a day and mm -hmm. I would always bring on a special guest, like, you know, someone like yourself, come on and, and talk to us about, you know, the rejections and overcoming or, you know, everybody would kind of come on and talk about something different. I, I told our staff, like, now is the time for you to do exactly what you said, network and educate yourself. And we ended up, we really were not selling probably for the first month. And then we kind of transitioned to kind of making them identify people that are closable now. Yep. You know, it was more, Hey, check-ins and just, Hey, let me know. But we've done at the minor league level over 300,000 in sales Wow! just during quarantine. And so That's terrific. that is uh, it's a testament to these guys in mm -hmm. the sense that they were able to learn to identify that. And again, I know you talked about like it being in poor taste. We wanted to not come across that way of course. because it's very easy to. And so they had to, push the ones they could push and the other ones it's like, Hey, let's, let's circle back up in June or July. Yep. And 100%. I'll tell you what, it's been, it's been very successful and uh, you know, it's good to see those guys, you know, kind of develop. So, That's uh, great but it's been, hear. it's been good. So. Yeah. No, you touched on a, a couple interesting points. I agree. I mean, I think for the first couple of weeks, months, I think most teams and leagues are doing the same thing. I mean, we have to touch base with these people in some capacity. Yep you can't be pitching a product. A, a lot of teams didn't even have a product to pitch, but you don't, 
you don't know what someone's experience has been. I mean, yeah. to you, you may be thinking, well, I can't wait till sports come back, you know, like let's open things up to them. They may have gone through something really difficult, you know, and so you don't want to come off in any way like you're crossing a line. But at some point after a couple of months of checking in and talking to them about how things are going, at some point you do have a job to do and you do have to start selling product. And, and so those people that can transition sort of from that comfortable phase to actually closing business, I think is, is a great testament to, to you know, your staff and other people who have been able to do that because it is, it's a very challenging landscape. Um, and, and like you said, you can come off one of two ways. And so it's really important to pay attention to your messaging and, and as a rep, be, be, you know, really honed in on, on what you're trying to say. Um, Cause it's a strange time right now for sure. So. Yeah. Well, no, I want to thank you for joining me, man. It was great talking to you. I mean, I could probably talk to you all day. Uh, <laughs> got some good stories and just some good experience. And I, I love the website though. So, um, Thanks. you know, keep it up. I'm going to keep checking it out. You should Thanks, uh, consider doing some videos too. And, um, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, I think you have a lot that you can, you know, give to, you know, people out there that are looking to improve themselves. Appreciate you know? that. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting time. And, and I mean, you kind of touched on it too, like being through it in the minor leagues and you just, you get all these different experiences. And I love talking to, to reps in basketball and in the minor leagues and in hockey and in football, because everyone's dealing with similar objections, but different. And everyone yeah. has some solutions, you know, that you may not have. So I think it's really, it's more important now than ever to, to sort of start building those relationships. And I appreciate the, the, the comments on the website. Hopefully it helps people out and, you know, look, things are gonna turn their way back around at some point here. So let's, let's make sure we're ready, you know, as a, as an industry and, and at the top of our game, because we're going to start having to bring in some dollars here, you know, to make up for lost time and, and you can't afford, can't afford a slow start, you know, once we finally get the spout back on. So. No, it's, it's, for me, it's about coming out of this thing full speed, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, just getting there. So, yep. but no, let's keep in touch, man. And uh, it's good talking to you. Yeah, you too. Thanks again for having me on, Andrew. I appreciate it.